Good evening and welcome to this international webinar at Believers Church Medical College and Hospital. It's a great privilege to welcome each one of you. And today's being a hundred webinar, it's all the more important. Artificial womb facilities which are AI powered can spin out 30,000 babies in 10 months. Jacob, you're muted. Good evening and welcome to this international webinar at Believers Church Medical College and Hospital. This is our hundredth webinar. Artificial womb facilities, AI powered. This is the buzzword for the week. 30,000 babies can be spun out in 10 months time without a mother's womb. How is artificial intelligence shaping the ecosystem of healthcare and the whole globe? We need to know that. And for that, we have today's webinar. To give an overview and to take over, we have our illustrious director and CEO of the Believers Church Medical College and Hospital, and also the former director of CMC Bellor, pioneering hepatologist and gastroenterologist, Professor Dr. George Chandy Machitra, sir. Over to you, dear George Chandy, sir. Thank you, Jacob. It's been a privilege to have so many of you as part of our journey, which was necessitated by the COVID mm -hmm. pandemic. And we realized that we could reach out to one another, probably one of the side effects, but actually a good side effect of the pandemic. Over the last 99 sessions, we've learned a lot from each other. We've had Arvind and Uli and Sunil amongst the galaxy of stars speaking at several mm -hmm. sessions. And it's helped us here at the Believers Church Medical College Hospital. And we've heard from several other institutions, several people who've told us that it has been a great learning experience, educational experience, and a blessing. So we believe that this 100th webinar on a topic which is very topical, which is very contemporary, where today we find it difficult to practice holistic care, where we find that it is a lot of it is doctor-centered, and not patient-centered. In the middle of all this, how do we ensure that we stay focused on getting the best out of technology, getting the best of what is available for our people? So I believe that the next hour is going to be very exciting, listening to three luminaries bringing to us thoughts about this very important, exciting area. And we are looking forward to listen to them. Over to you, back to you, Jacob. Thank you so much, sir. It's been your vision and your push that has brought us here. Thank you so much for the great vision that you gave us with these webinars. Our first speaker for the day is none other than Professor Dr. Sunil Thomas Chandy. Sir is a former director of Christian Medical College, Bellor and is currently serving as the Chief Medical Officer of ITC India. Traveling and speaking widely on health and management topics, he has been invited to national and international conferences as a resource person. In his tenure as Director of CMC, he conceptualized and designed the 1,700-bed hospital in Bellor to broaden the spectrum of care offered by CMC. He also spent short stints in Adelaide, Australia, Musket, Omen, and Brunei in different clinical leadership roles. Currently, as Chief Health Executive of ITC India, he is helping them recalibrate their healthcare priorities. Although a tertiary care specialist, he has always been a champion of whole person approach in health and an advocate of compassionate healthcare. So let us hear from him his side of this whole. AI in healthcare. 
paradigm. Welcome, dear Sunil sir. Over to you. Thank you, Jacob, for your kind words. Uh, just give me half a minute to uh, put this on for you. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. It's visible. Okay, so uh, the task uh, given to all of us is to uh, deliberate on something which was the heart and soul of medicine. But as it would seem, it is slowly being shown the door. Uh, I know that this is a very controversial statement because the, uh, the people in, involved with the digital technology and tech development will deny this, saying that this is a way by which more time will be available to clinicians to give compassionate care. I can't move my slide for some reason. Okay, okay, that's better. So let me start with this picture, which uh, the senior people in the group will be aware, Dr. Arvind, Dr. Uli, would be familiar with uh, the infirmary experience or at least would have seen this in various countries. Where if you look carefully at the picture, you will see tender loving care being the uh, soul and substance of uh, everything that happened within the four walls of a hospital. There's a patient and there are people who are, you know, walking around, talking to patients, getting their history, getting valuable information, touching them and uh, giving them tender loving care. This has somehow changed and uh, this is something that we find uh, more commonly in intensive care and in modern hospitals where everything is about gadgets. Uh, you can hardly see the patient. In fact, you can see the gadgets more than the patient. The patient is submerged uh, under wires and gadgets and batteries and connections. And his entire personhood seems to be represented in graphs and you know, lines and numbers. And this is the new direction in which healthcare is going. Surely we can say that healthcare is, has come a long way. And there's no doubt that this is something that we have to welcome. It is unavoidable because everything in life is developing on those uh, digital lines. So we are at this uh, point, the junction of uh, a division, a diversion between compassion and uh, technology being uh, seemingly being contradictory to each other. And the discussion today is about uh, where do we stand as a caring community? So the question is, is technology replacing the intangible soft uncountable, unmeasurable element of compassion, which was part and parcel of our training. So let's ask this question first, of what is the purpose of technology? Why is there so much of importance given to technology? Because like in every other field, technology surely has made some of our systems and our delivery methods very efficient. For example, looking at a, at a monitor, a multimodal monitor, you can get a glimpse of what is happening inside the patient in terms of heart rate, in terms of blood pressure and oxygen status, so on and so forth. Several parameters can be assessed very efficiently and very accurately. Because we are looking at uh, things that are not measurable clinically, it makes the treatment very safe, very accurate. And uh, undoubtedly, several lives have been saved because of this finesse that digital technology offers. It has a multiplier effect because it's possible to monitor on a central control panel. Several patients can be looked at simultaneously and we can increase our efficiency with the same amount of clinical energy that uh, doctors and nurses may have. And therefore it does save time for us. It has also made uh, data collection very objective. There's less of subjectivity, let me put it that way. And we are able to speak more confidently about biochemists, mm. biochemists, other things that are going on. And how does it do that? 
digital technology has uh, become efficient by this entire domain of uh, mechanization, miniaturization. You know, you have made something that was the big CT scans of the 80s is uh, now been, you know, become much smaller. You have gastroscopes and various kinds of scopes which have become smaller and smaller, which gives access to these very clever devices into areas that were very remote and inaccessible. It is also now possible to manage someone's illness uh, by being physically absent, remote, either by robotics or by telemedicine or whatever. Uh, as I mentioned, it does save time and it has made things very objective. But let's pause a minute and think about what is the social impact of health technology? I think it is important to realize that healthcare and education and you know, certain sectors like these are completely different from the automobile factory or manufacturing, which is very mechanized and very impersonal. Healthcare is different. And therefore, uh, like digital technology has achieved for factories and and uh, big companies, it is doing the same thing, unfortunately, in healthcare. It has allowed us a, a distance. It has uh, kind of facilitated the doctor and the patient to be a little further away from the patient. You need not go to the patient anymore. You can do chart rounds, you can do digital rounds and get an equal glimpse of the patient who you would have had to go and speak to in the old days. And therefore, I believe that this has also desensitized us because as we will discuss uh, later, there is a close connection between compassion and physicality. Uh, this is something that I have learned. The more distant you are to something, the less sensitive you become to those issues. You're further away from the patient, the less empathetic you are likely to feel. And uh, it is the absolute truth that digital technology is not helping to enhance the necessary element, the ingredient of compassion in healthcare. It has also disrupted our thinking and we like to say that in a very positive way that you know, everything is being disrupted. Yes, in a good way, yes, but is it disrupting so much that the very soul and substance of healthcare is in jeopardy? Has it dehumanized? Yes, it, it has. I'll show you a picture of uh, young doctors not even looking at the patient because he is busy interrogating and navigating the screen in front of him because data collection has been given a lot of importance. Disease is not. Disease is measured in data. As I mentioned, it's possible to do chart rounds. And even in good hospitals, there's a lot of time spent in the nursing station just looking at the charts, the numbers, the data, and very little spare time spent around the patient. And of course, we are living in an age where retail medicine, virtual medicine, what's called generally called Uberization, where you can order something like you order your food and it will come to your door. Atul Gawande, the person who's famous for lateral thinking in medicine has said this, that physicians and nurses have become swamped with uh, overcoming the learning curves of using these computer devices and EMR, cutting down one-on-one -on -one time with their patient. And it actually reflects on compassion. Look at this doctor, senior doctor, who is uh, more concerned with the information that comes through the smartphone and what he sees on the screen, the patient is nowhere. Or like this, where the patient sits on the side and you're busy, it is the requirement because you'll get pulled up the next day if the data is not complete. Let me go to compassion and these are some of my views that there is a reverse relationship between compassion and distance. The more the distance, physical distance, the less uh, the empathy factor, the sympathy factor, which will finally turn to lack of compassion. When you're away, you communicate less. And we live in an age where we prefer to communicate with uh, sign language or digital technology and not talk to one another directly. We spend very little time with the patient. 
but time is very important to generate and sustain compassion. It's not enough to just have 10 seconds of a high and buy, but you need time to talk to people. And that's not true for medicine, it's true for, for you know, even leadership and management. We're over touch. Our professors and our teachers have taught us the value of touch, and this has to continue. I'm sure nobody would uh, like what we see in this picture where a robotic obstetrician is uh, coming to a mother and a newborn child to get the history and find out what is happening. Would you like to be the patient? I'm not so sure, but this is the way medicine is heading. Now, what is the difference between compa compassion and empathy? Empathy is just the ability to be one with the patient, which need not convert to an action. Whereas compassion is one level further where, uh, you know, that emotional involvement or reaction will culminate in a certain action that is in favor of uh, the person affected. So the question is, I'm sure the young people are asking this, does compassion matter in medicine? Does it uh, mean that technology is working against compassion? Is it compatible? And the, the third question uh, is whether they can coexist. There's an intensivist uh, in the US, uh, Stephen Zisiak, who has uh, given an excellent talk on TED, where he did some research and found that in any hospital system, 50% of the staff uh, believe, and 50% of the patients believe that the healthcare that they get is not compassionate. 75% of the patients experience lack of compassion in the dealings and 70% uh, felt that compassion opportunities were missed by the systems that were in place. And uh, less than 1% of the doctor-patient communications hover around any sentiment of compassion. And the recent burnout of doctors, which is resulting in, I'm sure Dr. Uli will vouch for this, nearly 20, 30% of the doctors have left the profession. And there's a high degree of burnout, which makes communication and compassion much worse. There's also evidence from scientific studies to show that compassionate care um, will result in more meticulousness and leading to lesser errors. It uh, significantly buffers stress-mediated disease in patients, makes their responses better, it modulates their pain expressions, there's positive neuroendocrine effects, and it often results in a much better compliance and better self-care as far as patients are concerned. It also causes low resource utilization, and there's a Rochester University study to corroborate this. Fewer tests are ordered, fewer hospitalizations result, and fewer referrals happen as a consequence of compassionate personal care. This is a very common uh, picture from, with the reference to the Bible, the Good Samaritan. And there are several touch points, the head, the heart, the hands, you know, the touch that the caregiver gives, and of course, the everything that makes, uh, gives access to healthcare. Another eminent person called Arthur Sklenman had said this from Harvard, that caregiving is a deeply interpersonal, relational practice. The laying of hands, empathetic witnessing, listening to the illness, so on and so forth, is the moral face of a caregiving physician. And I must say, at least to generate some discussion is that Computerized fair or digital medicine has not yet evolved to a stage where it can replace the element of compassion. And this picture says it all. Behind those complex machines, behind the data generating equipment that we are so fond of, there is still a need for warmth. And one smart nurse knowing that this could not be given in this ICU setting did this. She put warm water in two gloves because what that patient needed was the simulation of a warm hand over the suffering hand. And that speaks much about the need for compassion in healthcare. I think I'll stop there and leave it for discussion as we move ahead. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Sunil sir, for that really deep and touching talk. And let's move on to the next speaker for the day. Our next speaker for the day is from the United States of America. He's the founder and pres president of Innovator MD. He's the member advisory board of directors, American Board of Artificial Intelligence and Medicine. And he's the co-founder and former CTO of Crest Network. He's also the co-founder and former chairman of the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs. By training, he's an emergency physician and at heart and coming out in all vibrant colors, he is a champion of AI in healthcare. So to champion the cause for AI, and to bat for the future of AI in healthcare. May I welcome Dr. Uli K. Chetipali for his talk. Over to you, Dr. Uli. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you all. And, uh, you know, it's great to be uh, on the stage with uh, such uh, luminaries, um, you know, Sunil, Arvind, and George. Um, and of course, Jacob, uh, and I want to congratulate you on your, you know, 100th, uh, you know, webcast. Uh, it's, it, it takes a lot of effort and uh, dedication to be able to do so many um, uh, programs. So thank you very much for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to be uh, here. Um, I wanted to uh, share a few slides with you. I, I call it few, but uh, let's see if I can pare it down a little bit. <clears throat> I'm really excited uh, because, uh, you know, this is an opportunity uh, to speak with, uh, you know, my home country uh, physicians, which I rarely get. Um, so as Jacob said, my name is Yuli Cheripali. Um, one of the biggest challenges of, um, you know, today's medicine, I'll talk about why you know, technology is needed, why artificial intelligence is needed. Um, I, I really like what, uh, you know, our previous speaker, um, you know, talked about, you know, Sunil, uh, about how compassion is essential for caregiving. And I totally believe that, and I totally uh, understand uh, why it is so important, because, you know, humans need that, that human touch to be able to uh, deliver care and also provide that support, emotional support, that trust and, and everything else that goes with the human interactions. But here is what is happening. I'll talk, I'll touch upon a few subjects, few topics, and then we'll go from there. Um, here's the problem. The biggest problem I see is that with the knowledge of medicine, that is our biggest challenge. Um, we know that, you know, you know, we call it the right brain and the left brain, right? So the right brain is, is where you are providing, you know, the, although it's not anatomically correct, but uh, let's, uh, you know, philosophically, the right brain is where you're showing the compassion, where you're showing that empathy, uh, and um, you know, building that trust with that with the patient. But here's a problem that's happening in the left brain. In the left brain, you're supposed to consume a lot of data and uh, and knowledge and wisdom that all that all that experience that goes into uh, developing into a great clinical practitioner, right? Um, and that's the, the left brain is the challenge where all this data, all the knowledge, all, you know, that keeps increasing and is encroaching on the right brain functions, which is the empathy, the trust. So how do we decrease the burden on the left brain? So let's look at, you know, the current situation. What's the big picture? I'm going to talk about a few things that are happening, you know, in the U.S., um, but also it's not unusual to see this in, in, in other countries also. So here's the big picture. The population is aging. You know, I'm, I'm sure you must have seen where countries, the younger people are 
getting less and less and the older people are getting more. And so this is, uh, you know, from Pew Research, where as time goes on, what's going to happen is that the, the, the ratio or the proportion of older people increases compared to the younger people. And how does that matter? Well, as you get older, you get more medical problems, which also means that the cost of care increases as you get older. The other problem, uh, you know, this is a, you know, from 2016, but when you look at the economies of the world, you know, the blue one is where U.S. is, um, India is, um, you know, the blue one on the other side, the dark blue. But U.S. healthcare system spends as much money as the GDP of Germany, which is number four um, in this graph. So that's the amount of money which is about 20% of, of, of GDP of the US, that's what is spent on healthcare. And that's not sustainable, the cost of healthcare. The reason for that is the technology, the amount of knowledge, the amount of things that we can do with patients is increasing. And this is a consumer price index graph. And uh, obviously the purple line is where healthcare is going. Um, everything else, you know, the housing, the food, transportation, everything else stays the same or stayed the same uh, with time or all, or sometimes it is decreasing, like, for example, the clothing. And, uh, you know, if you think U.S. is advanced, but here is the problem. We are spending a lot of money, but the performance compared to other countries is not that great. It's actually, you know, number 11 or number 13, you know, the way, uh, depending on the way you look at it. So it's it's way down. And so what's happening there? Here is what is happening with the number of studies. The knowledge that is accumulating in the literature keeps increasing. By now it has you know gone off the chart. Um, so how do we take all that knowledge and incorporate into your practice into making sure that you are using the latest information. And of course, in the US, the reimbursement, the regulations, medical legal you know, challenges, that is a big burden. And so what happens, you know, the, like Dr. Chandy was talking about the burnout. Burnout is a major problem. Almost half of the physicians report that they're burning out. It's hard to keep up with the technology. It's hard to keep up with the knowledge and, and, the, and, the, and the demands that are placed on physicians. So what's happening on the technology side? Of course, the data, the amount of data that, that is accumulating keeps increasing, thousandfold, a millionfold. And each with each day, the acceleration keeps going up. The hardware speeds are increasing. The machines are becoming faster. And the key algorithms are multiplying, you know, where machines can start thinking about, you know, how to, um, how to take information from this data and come up with intelligent solutions. Um, so here are some things that I recommend for, you know, to be able to decrease this, this pressure on physicians. Number one, st stop treating, you know, we call it volume-based care, which is where we, you treat when the patient is sick. We should switch to value-based care, where you treat a patient to stay healthy, not getting sick. You know, that's how you decrease the cost of care. That's how you bring value. Right now, most of the care is given in the hospital. I think it should move upstream where the cost of care would be much less, um, maybe in the patient's home, maybe in the, you know, in, in the social setting where the patient is or before they become a patient, right? And then this is the most prom promising thing for me. <clears throat> now, this is the traditional method, scientific method of gaining new knowledge, right? You have a question, you collect the sample data, and then you answer it. Or you can do a, you know, a randomized study. You can compare, you know, interventions with controls. But that is the traditional method of gaining knowledge in, in science and medical science, especially. But here is what is going to change with the use of technology. 
The promise of artificial intelligence is that now we have access to the whole population's data. So you don't necessarily need a small sample, which again, in the, in the traditional method, which is very expensive and time consuming, here you have all the data that you need at your fingertips. And so now you can ask that question to the data that is already collected. And that's how you're flipping the science, the development of science of medicine or the research on how you do research. And this is the most promising uh, thing for me is that we are in this phase where we're just now beginning to understand the value of data. So right now it's all manual, it's collecting, and then the physician has to look at it and physician has to decide. And so they have to keep all this thing uh, in their mind while they are doing the work of caregiving or delivering care. Imagine if all that work can be assigned to a machine and that's what I call punishing the machine. Right now, the machines are punishing the doctors, right? Because they are be doctors are becoming slaves to the machines. But imagine a day when the machines can actually provide the work that our left brain is doing and leave the physicians to be able to do the most important work, which is the human touch, which is where human beings or doctors are good at, which is delivering that empathy, that compassion, and also that trust that patients need. Here's one of the systems I developed uh, for uh, my previous employer, where data from the physician, the researcher, and the patient is collected and analyzed and delivered. So how does machine learning and artificial intelligence help? So here is what we can do with the data. We can figure out the what we call descriptive analytics, what has happened. In other words, let's say a patient comes in to the emergency or to the hospital, you know that this person had a heart attack or having chest pain. So what has happened with the previous you know, 100 patients, 1,000 patients, maybe 10,000 patients? Now you're able to get access to that data. And you can actually predict what is going to happen to this person in front of you by looking at the data from 100,000 patients that came before him or her with the same symptoms, right? You can predict what is going to happen. And so what, what gives me a lot of uh, you know, excitement and joy is that you can now use that data, use that information, use those algorithms to be able to change the course of disease in this particular patient. Because now that you know what has happened to all these other patients, now you can actually predict and prevent, you know, bad outcomes so that you can prescribe the right, right treatments. And this also has very important implications um, for preventing disease, right? I'm not gonna go into detail on how we did this. Um, let me see, I'm going to, okay. So here's the, here's the thing about technology. Is it really useful? You know, first thing we need to question every single piece of technology that comes to us. You know, is it really useful, clinically useful, not, not just you know administratively or whatever other reasons why we are collecting that data. The second question is, will it be used? Um, now, does the market really support that? You know, again, I you know I'm looking at the entrepreneurship side of of things. Um, and then, is it usable? You know, is is if it becomes too too complex or too unwieldy? You know, then it it's not usable, right? And so that then it becomes useless. Um, so I'll conclude with this statement. You know, computers are useless. The technology is totally useless. They can only give you answers. They don't ask the right questions. And it is up to us, the physicians, that need to ask the right questions. 
And for that, you need to understand how technology works, how computers work, so that we can ask the right questions and be able to make the machines work harder. And we punish the machine instead of the machine punishing us. That's where I think the promise of AI is. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll stop there. Thank you, sir, for the eye opener of a talk. We did see a very nice balance in what you said. And when it comes to moderation, it's going to be very interesting and very healthy discussion is going to happen. So let's move on to our next speaker, Dr. Arvind Singh. Dr. Arvind Singh is the CEO of Eternity Limited, a device and processes consultancy, which caters to all AI related stuff in medicine. And he embarked on this after retirement from the NHS. A graduate from the CMC Wellor Medical College, he went on to undergo two training fellowships at John Hopkins and at Harvard and operated on complex diabetics and premature babies with retinopathy of prematurity and served as consultant with your retinal surgeon for a good 21 years. After completing his Master of Business Administration from Strathclyde Business School in Glasgow, he went on to empower entrepreneurs in AI and medicine and startups. He's also been a senior examiner with the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow and the International Council of Ophthalmology. So here we have a person who is a surgeon, an ophthalmologist at heart and has been doing that all his life and now very much into artificial intelligence and it's going to be really interesting. Let's uh, welcome Dr. Arvind Singh. Over to you, sir. So you're muted. Can you please unmute yourself? Arvind, sir, you're muted. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, let me compliment George Chandy, not just for chairing this symposium, but leading the effort to educate with this 100th webinar. This shows his commitment to education and training. And I'd like to thank Jacob for uh, organizing the symposium and giving me an opportunity to listen to two very wise people, Sunil and Uli, whose writings I have followed with great interest. Now, I don't believe uh, that uh, artificial intelligence is anything in itself. It's merely a tool that we can use to our advantage, provided we know what we want from it and what its limitations are. Unless we ask the right question, we will not get the right answer. As someone once said, artificial intelligence cannot be a substitute for natural stupidity. Now, looking at artificial intelligence, I remember when we were all training, we had the option of ordering investigations. And very often, when we didn't know what was going on, we ordered an investigation. I saw one of the first things that I saw after coming to UK was a notice from the laboratory which said, before you order an investigation, before you order a diagnostic test, ask yourself what you'll do if the test is positive. And then ask yourself what you'll do if the test is negative. And if the two answers are the same, then the test is not required. Similarly, we have gone on to do more and more technical uh, processes without actually getting a full understanding on what we are doing. I still remember when we had a trainee or a lot of trainees were ordering fluorescein angiographies when they couldn't find anything wrong. So using a touch of sarcasm in my teaching, I called one of the students, I asked him to bring a fluorescein angiogram film, hold it to the ear and say, do you hear anything? He said, no, he was bewildered. 
I said the fluorescein by itself does not talk to you. It doesn't give you an answer. If you don't find anything wrong with the macula, if you don't find any macular symptoms, ordering a fluorescein angiogram is pointless. When you see a problem at the macula, and then you order a fluorescein angiogram, you can see the pathology behind it. So for a long time, technology has been used as a crutch when we don't know what is actually going on. Artificial intelligence is an extremely useful tool which has developed to help us enormously as uh, Sunil so eloquently underlined. But we need to know what it can do for us. And to get it going, we need a considerable amount of clinical investment. And this is exactly what we did when we tried to devise algorithms for developing, for picking up the features in a retinal photograph in diabetics. How we did it was we sat down virtually at that time at the start of the pandemic with the AI experts and three of us clinicians, and we went through photograph by photograph, explaining to our IT colleagues what we wanted out of them. To explain to them an aneurysm does not have the same value wherever it may be on the retina. An aneurysm close to the macula is much more valuable to us and tells us more and affects the vision more than an aneurysm out in the periphery. And with this sharing of clinical knowledge with the IT experts, we were able to explain to them exactly what we were looking for. And what we were looking for from this algorithm was the ability for the system to diagnose diabetic retinopathy and make two kinds of decisions. Number one, can the patient be discharged or does the patient have to be brought back for a review? And if brought back for a review, what should be the time interval? If there was early proliferative changes, we wanted the patient to come back quickly for laser treatment. If there were none, then we could follow up the patient. But when the IT colleagues understood exactly what we were looking for, they devised for us algorithms that allowed us to get this information and make a decision on whether the patient should be reviewed or does not need to be reviewed. With this end in mind, we went through 100 photographs, retinal photographs, and clinically decided what should be done. And we then asked the IT colleagues to run their algorithms on the same 100 photographs and see what the system will predict. And to our joy, we found that our predictions were 97% accurate. And we were even further delighted when we found that Google, working on an exactly similar system, found their algorithm was 58% accurate. And we felt this was due to the fact that we liaised very closely as clinician with the people developing the AI solution for us. That was our understanding of AI as a tool used appropriately. And when it does, it can considerably help the clinician with the process of diagnostic and treatment. But the more important thing is, as we have discussed in the, in the discussion today, the compassionate care side. And that leads me to another anecdote and an experience. I was working at a hospital which was, uh, which was a high-tech hospital set up by two American professors to basically take care of patients. But when we found the hospital was bought by the Scottish government, it became part of the NHS and it was being used as a waiting time center. And what we had set up was that a van driven by driver, let's call her Mary because that was her name, would pick up the passengers from home, the patients, and bring them to the hospital where we would perform cataract surgery on them. And in the evening, Mary would drop them off in the same minivan. And one day I found that I had 10 patients who had been brought into the uh, by Mary, and I operated on them, cataract operations on them, and then they were dropped home. I saw Mary after she had dropped the last passenger, home, last patient home, and Mary had a rose in her hand. And I asked Mary, how did you get the rose? And she said, you know, your last patient, Mrs. Williamson, when I dropped her home, she plucked this rose and gave it to me. So I said, Mary, I'll buy you a coffee if you tell me what exactly happened. And Mary explained to me that she picked up 
Mrs. Williamson in the morning, she was the first patient to be picked up. So she spent the maximum amount of time in Mary's company in the bus. And she was very anxious. And Mary asked us, why are you so anxious? And Mary said, oh, I really don't know what's going to happen to me. I've had a cataract and I've heard all sorts of stories about people having problems, sometimes not being able to see anything. And Mary started assuring her. Mary said, no, you, everything will go well. We know the doctor who's operating on you. He'll explain everything to you. He has tremendous amount of compassion and empathy. He'll, he's a very good surgeon. He will discuss everything with you before he consents you. And during the procedure, he'll talk to you because under local and after the operation, he will reassure you that everything is fine. And that's when I'll drop you home. And she said, when she picked her up uh, after the operation, the lady said, you know, it was exactly the way you had said. I was quite relaxed. The doctor explained everything to me. He reassured me during the procedure. And then afterwards came and saw everything was doing fine. And I was discharged home. And I'm so happy. And she plucked the rose and gave it to Mary. It brought home to the fact that it took me eight minutes to do the cataract operation. And I used very expensive technology, machines which were driven by AI, Alcon state-of-the-art machine costing 100,000 pounds. Yet, in the overall healing process, Mary's contribution to this lady's healing was far more significant than my eight hour minutes of cataract surgery. And that brought home the point that, uh, that uh, Sunil has been emphasizing about personal care. And it also brought home the fact that this person, delivery of personal care is not confined to the surgeon or physician alone. But if he has chosen the right team to surround him, then it all adds up to an effect greater than one individual can provide. And with the distancing that has occurred, with our technology coming into it, has taken us away from being able to deliver the patient-centric, empathy-based care. What is empathy care? When you put yourself in the patient's position and convince yourself that what the patient wants is exactly what you would want if you were at the receiving end of the care. I have um, personal experience of it. When I became uh, with your retinal surgeon, part of the reason was that I had a retinal detachment in my third year of medical school which was fixed very nicely. So when a patient comes to me with a detached retina, I know exactly how he is feeling. But the foundations of this empathetic healing did not start after I became an ophthalmologist. I was fortunate enough to be educated at Christian Medical College, Velour. And I found it is not uncommon in Velour, or at least those days, for a senior, people like George Chandy, who was a third year student when I joined, a fourth year student, to stop you in the corridor and ask you questions. In some institutions, it might be considered bullying, but in Velo, it was considered a way of educating an individual with a personal contact. I remember an eminent cardiac surgeon, Colin John, who was two years senior to me, stopping me in the corridor and asking me for five um, congenital cyanotic heart diseases. And I still haven't forgotten them there with five T's. Similarly, causes for raised JVP. In fact, this was brought home to me about six months, uh, six years ago. I was in the operating theater. There was a student training for anesthesia, and I had a trainee with me in ophthalmology. And the anesthetic trainee turned to the anesthetist and said, What are the causes of raised JVP? And in a usual way to humiliate me, as anesthetists often do to surgeons, he turned to me and said, Can you tell him the five causes? And I rattled off the causes right from increased venous return to rupture sinus of well salva. And this guy was stunned. He said, how come you know this in ophthalmology? I said, it's all my undergraduate training in Velour. And I still remember being stopped by Colin John in the corridor to be asked these questions. So the empathy and the person-to-person -person contact, which played an important role in my understanding of what compassionate healthcare delivery is, started off as an, um, as an uh, undergraduate. To link the two, I remember sitting as a first year student attending a graduation ceremony at Velour. The best outgoing graduate at that point was Dr. Maman Chandy, who subsequently 
went on to be the director of uh, Tata Memorial Kathira. And Maman Chandi, at the end of his talk, said, I would like to thank my teachers who have not only told me, taught me the science of medicine, but also its art. And that stayed with me. So when I look at the topic now, I find that IT, AI, and all research that is undertaken to find the algorithms is actually the science of healthcare. But compassionate delivery of healthcare to the patient is the art. Thank you. Thank you, dear Arvind, sir, for that lucid approach on AI in healthcare. And you went back in time and you brought us beautiful stories uh, which were intricately weaved, taking us to the depths of uh, uh, learning in healthcare and also bringing in valid points about AI. So without much ado, let me hand over to the moderator for the day, our very own Jarchandi, sir. Uh, sir, over to you. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you so much, Arvind, Uli, and Sunil. Would Sunil or Uli like to add anything further after um, listening to Arvind and Uli? I think he, our, Dr. Arvind uh, put it very beautifully, the art and science of medicine. Uh, we need to, the human side is the art and the technology side is the science, is going to be the science of medicine. Nothing to add to that. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa Neil. Yeah, I would echo the same uh, words that Dr. Uli has said, that uh, uh, the distinction between the hard science and the soft art has been very lucidly brought out. And uh, this is really the two ends of the spectrum when we say compassion. Uh, somehow the twin doesn't uh, seem to meet very easily in the middle. Uh, there's no doubt that technology has transformed our lives on every front. And I keep thinking about how Google Maps has transformed our city life. You see, and I consider the G Maps or the navigating systems that is there on our smartphones, in our cars, as one of the amazing contributions to humankind. It is not only efficient, it is accurate, but it also costs you nothing. And that is where it contrasts with uh, many things that are happening today in healthcare, which seems to be fascinating, but the cost impact is never talked about. At least for you know, a country like India, where people are suffering from anemia, women and children, the GBD report and the Oxfam report shows a very dismal picture. You see, that's the real healthcare scenario. And uh, when we talk about these fascinating digital transformations that are in the pipeline, why is it that there is no projection on the costs? Uh, 60 million people in India are driven to abject penury because of the existing healthcare system. 60 million people. So the impact of this has to be, you know, I really hope we hear that digital technology is going to reduce care, it is going to make it affordable, it is going to save time for the doctors. I have, I'm very cautious to believe that because it has not yet happened. Yeah. So the twin must meet in the center and I think the effort is on us physicians to like Dr. Uli said, to ask the right questions because technology is going at the speed of art and Senna in a Formula One race will crash. And, uh, you know, it affects people in the developing countries much more because we are just lapping up what is being told to us without any visible benefit as far as actual clinical health care is concerned. We had an interesting experience in our hospital recently where, you know, when I, I struggle a little bit with technology, being much older to all of you, 
So I was trying to balance the two. How much time do I look at the computer? How much time do I spend with the patient? And uh, in trying to do that, I also found that my junior colleagues uh, are looking, uh, tending to look more and more at the computer than at the patient because they want to make sure that all that they write is correct. They want to make sure that it's all put down correctly. So it's good that we are struggling with this, but it's quite easy to go the other way. It's very, very easy to go the other way because you have limited time with each patient. And out of that, you have to make sure that all that you write, all that you put down is correct. So we haven't really been able to come to grips with this problem because once you do uh, what the NABH wants, JCI wants, make sure that everything is put down properly. Uh, the time that you spend with the patient, the holistic care that we talked about is becoming less and less. How do you marry the two? How do you balance the two? But at least we are struggling with it now. Maybe after some time, we won't even think about it. That's what is scary. Uh, George, what you make a very valid point. I think one of the things that I've always said is that in a, any healthcare delivery system, the strategic control of the delivery must lie with a practicing physician. When you say in your experience, I think that kind of leadership is what makes the difference. In other words, a person who is sitting in an office somewhere remotely and making policy, expecting data to be fed to them, if the person is not a frontline clinician, they have no clue of what they are demanding and how somebody will provide it. I think to put it on the con in the context, the decision-making must reside with somebody who is in a patient-facing position. And I read with interest every time somebody puts out a business side of medicine saying you can make more money doing this, you can make money. You can almost count of Sunil Chandy's comment on it saying it's the care that is more important than making money. I mean, somebody is asking me the other day why I didn't go into full-time practice. And I said, you know, having studied at Velour completely screwed up my perspective on making money <laughs> because you don't put it anywhere. You, you get the feeling that if you are a good clinician, you will never be playing banjo at the railway station or begging on the street. You will always have a safety net under you. So to go out and pursue whatever you want without worrying about uh, making money comes because Valor has given the kind of education that will always stand as a safety net. If you did nothing else but just pursue that education and that clinical care and that ministry of healing, you will always be financially okay. Maybe you won't drive a Rolls Royce, but you'll drive a high quality bicycle if you want to. But I, I, I found that uh, you know the value of care that we provide, sometimes we ourselves don't appreciate how valuable it is to the recipient. It doesn't have to do with the money, but just by holding somebody's hand, pulling your chair closer to them on the bed and saying that, uh, this is what you need. I mean, I was just, you were making a very interesting point about hospital and care. My mother, who was 96, had a fall the other day, about two weeks ago. My GP showed up within five minutes or 10 minutes of my calling. And he told us, he's got a very dry sense of humor. He said, your mother should go into the hospital, but hospital is not a good place to be when you're unwell. And he said, we've got this hospital at home system in Scotland, which has been going on for a year. Do you know, my mother was put under the system we had visits from nurses twice a day and by caring, caring team three times a day. So we have five visits. They did ECGs at home. They did bloods every day. They did, and an occupational therapist came and assessed her needs. We had a hospital bed delivered at home uh, the second day with a special mattress, all these uh, bubbly things to prevent bed sores. But my mother got better care and is still getting better care at home than she could have got in the hospital. And the, the, the other point I want to use to illustrate, when I was doing my fellowship at Moorfield Eye Hospital, which is a flagship eye center in the UK, because I was funded by a charity, I was asked to do a report on the costs. And I demonstrated that the daily cost of keeping an inpatient at Moorfield Eye Hospital was 156 pounds. But, sorry, 172 pounds. 
and a room at the Ritz, which was the poshest hotel in <clears throat> London at that time, was 156 pounds. So if every one of our patients were admitted to the Ritz and a taxi provided to do the surgery and send them back, the hospital would have saved money. But nobody looked at it that way. But people were very busy. With, but actually, to provide the care with a, in their patient's own environment, and in UK, we are having more and more of it. And this is where Sunil's writings on how you can produce more care in the community where the patient is, has tremendous cost savings. But the reason we don't want to uh, focus on it is because there are a lot of people making money by a patient being in the hospital. And as a result of which, why would you want to why 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 would you want to keep the patient at home when you're losing enormous amount of money? I say this with due sarcasm. And this is very true in the United States also. I remember when Barack Obama was elected, a friend of mine here, one of the senior Tata executives, said, Why don't you go there and find out what he wants to do with regards to healthcare? So I went and saw a neurosurgeon friend of mine who was a professor of neurosurgery in Chicago and a pal of Barack Obama's. And I told her what's gonna happen. He says, you know, everything Obama wants to do is absolutely right, but it will be opposed from all quarters. Hospitals will oppose it because the reimbursement will be less. The doctors will oppose it because the reimbursement will be reduced, taking care of poor patients. Insurance companies will oppose it because it will mean they can't keep putting up insurance premium. And I said, what about 30 million people who don't have any insurance? She said, oh, who gives a damn about the 30 million people who don't have insurance? And this is exactly what happened. And I, one of the reasons we are very fortunate in uh, either in Velour or in, in UK is that everything I mentioned that was done for my mother, we didn't pay a penny for it. And it would have been the same if I was not a retired NHS consultant, if I was a cleaner, or, or a janitor, my mother would have received exactly the same thing, a hospital bed at home, all the care provided. So I think there is a lot to be said for providing care in the community at a fraction of the cost of what it means to care in the hospital. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think you, you raise a good point, uh, you know, which is when technology comes to us as physicians, you know, we evaluate. And we have to evaluate, you know, is this adding value? Is this making better patient outcomes uh, or making patient outcomes better? Uh, and so, you know, let's say, let's say if there's a new drug on the market or a new device, you know, we do, we do look at it with a critical viewpoint, right? You know, we, we want to look at the research, you know, we want to look at the clinical trials and we want to see, you know, is it really making a difference? Um, you know, I I worked uh, on a project where a large company, a large insurance company wants to figure out which drug for diabetes is good for which patients. Now, if you look at the market for type 2 diabetes and oral anti-diabetic medications, there are more than 60 different types of medicines, right? How is a physician to know which medicine will work for which patient? Is it just trial and error? And it, that goes on for months and sometimes years before their, their diabetes is controlled. How about if we can use technology to, to look at the variables of each patient and, and match it with somebody who has already tried that drug with the same variables and figure out, oh, this, there's higher chance of this drug working. So, in a way, you know, technology could potentially decrease the cost, but unless the physicians demand it, right? We need to demand that kind of scrutiny for every new technology that is introduced. Uh, what we did, you know, at, at uh, Kaiser Permanente was, okay, we have this algorithm that works great for chest pain patients that come to the emergency. Chest pain, by the way, is a pretty... Um, common uh, symptom that patients come to the emergency. So if we are having 100,000 visits a year, that means 10,000 patients come in with chest pain. So how you treat each patient depends on you know, what the physician thinks is happening, right? What if we 
help the physician with an AI algorithm that assess the risk of this person having a heart attack in the next seven days, right? And that's what we developed. And so what we did, you know, do you know if it really works? We don't know. Well, you know, what we did was we did a clinical trial. So 10 hospitals used the system. The other 11 hospitals were controls. And then we ran this test for about a year. And so there are ways where you can figure out if this technology is actually making a difference for patient outcomes. And, and that should be the ultimate goal, right? You know, we want better patient outcomes. If it is not doing that, then it is useless. And we, we as physicians need to demand that kind of scrutiny of every new technology that, is, that comes our way. Unless it is doing that, you know, then it's useless. So we have a lot of time for Casa Permanente because that is the closest you have clo to our National Health Service, where the value is in delivery of care rather than the Porsche that the manager drives. I think it's a, it, it, what you're saying is absolutely right. And the data gathering that both Sunil and you pointed out, the large scale data gathering on which the decisions are based is crucial. To, to delivering the kind of care that Kaiser did or Valor does or uh, NHS does. You know, I uh, and Dr. Yuli has brought out a very important point, the emphasis on physicians being on the center stage of uh, decision-making. Yeah. Absolutely true. I would take it one step uh, further to say that in the emerging technology, is at least what I see on LinkedIn and on net is that most of the health tech and digital tech initiatives have no physicians. Yeah. It is a engineering graduate or a biomedical engineer backed by some smart investors, angel investors who come out with this revolutionary. And if you look at the circle of people around, there are no physicians. And the physicians have been today, at least in India, made servile to believe what they are telling you, that you apply this on, there's no clinical trial, but it is applied. And, you know, they have some evaluations done in six months time, they've sold that and they moved on. So you, the technology, there is a commercial element of technology, which I am totally, you know, averse to. If you want to release a drug, it takes years and years. You want a decade of research. Yeah. Needed. They just want money. You see, and this is very unfortunate, and this is happening because physicians have been pushed to the periphery in the emerging technologies. Not only are they not able to make decisions because they are not involved in the conceptualization. I'm talking about what is happening on this side of the world. There are no clinical trials. There is no standardization. Hundreds of apps that are coming out that will predict the child, whether he's on the left side or right side, it will show you your blood pressure. Within six months, they've gone. They've sold themselves out. One. Yeah, you're right. I think an so, IT person setting up is doing it with an exit strategy as to what allows them to get out of the business with a considerable amount of money. Yeah, I mean, there's a recent post which talks about a hospital being okay. valued at 5x and somebody bought it and he's going to sell it at 10x and somebody else would buy it at 15x. So is this what healthcare is about? And it is all backed by technology. So I, this I, is something that we as physicians must resist because this is going to wreck the very soul of health okay, That's number one. Number two, which I see even in Velo, is that there is no bedside orientation to students because they're being told it's all artificial AI. The book will tell you, the algorithm will tell you. So there's no need to touch a patient. There's no need to talk to him. And therefore, there is already an article on the miserable, appalling status of clinical acumen in new medicals. They can't put an IV line. They don't know what a lumbar puncture is. They can't assess the history. And so are we looking at a future when there's no need to train doctors? Technology is going to, you know, artificial intelligence is going to do everything. So the whole point is all these things are good. Yeah. 
No, at the at the end at of the this day, whole effort of the technology industry. Yeah, absolutely, to to you're absolutely right. When yes. a manager was trying to push us into setting up the fa uh, fast track uh, same day cataract surgery, I sat down with him and I had to change. I said, you know, we are not doctors giving medicine. We are healers. I've always seen myself as a healer. And one thing you can't do, you can't fast track healing. Healing has to take its time. Healing starts when somebody walks into your consulting room, even before the patient opens his mouth. And the manager, fortunately for us, the manager who was helping us out, understood this. And he said, you know, why don't you decide the number of cataracts that should be done? And you decide the pathway for fast track, one stop cataract surgery. And we, we sort of made sure that patient was seen after surgery, not discharged to the optician. So if the complications arise, they arise later on. So I think what you're saying, Sunil, is very important. I think the present people being trained or people administering the training have put the patient contact much lower down. But when I, when I write an article, I always draw a circle saying doctor-patient interaction. That is sacred. Everybody else is a supporter. The accounts department tries to cost it. The human resources department tries to resource it. The hospital managers tries to facilitate it. But the sacred interaction in any healthcare system is the doctor and the patient. It can be a nurse and the patient. It can be a physiotherapist. One of the things that we are doing in UK quite effectively to reduce cost is that we are empowering nurses. In fact, at this particular point, most of the intraocular injections for macular degeneration of anti-VEGF substances are given by nurses, nurse-led clinics. And a colleague of mine from Truro did a study of 1,000 injections, and he found that the complication rate of nurse-injected eyes was far lower than the consultant-injected eyes or surgeon and the medical doctors injected eyes for the same for the simple reason that the nurses were much more careful. They injected, they explained things to the patient and the patient's satisfaction was also much greater. Doctor came for a few seconds, gave the injection, went off. Whereas the nurse talked to the patient, gave adequate local anesthesia. So I think what you're saying is absolutely right. We should train people instead of replacing doctors with machines. We should train other paraclinical workers or what are known as uh, assisted healthcare practitioners to deliver the quality of care the doctors give. You don't need somebody with a medical degree. You need a nice human being to deliver the care. But I think that's a much better way to go towards than replacing with machines. We can have machines everywhere. You can have your cardiopulmonary bypass being done by a sophisticated machine. But the guy who puts the cannula into the aorta has to be a surgeon. So similarly, I think our patient-facing interface has to be a human being. And that's the only way we can deliver compassionate care. If I tell my patient, you know what, I uh, prescribe this, pick up the prescription from the computer window, and then pharmacist will explain to you what you want. The patient will say, hold on, doctor. I mean, this is a classic case of my one of our colleagues, uh, Satish uh, Rao, who went to practice. He's from Haryana, and he was his father said, you are here on holiday. Why don't you sit down in a clinic and see a few patients? So he sat there, he would examine a patient, general physician, any right prescription. And the patient said, where's the medicine? He said, no, no, take this to the pharmacy and you can buy the medicine. The, the farmer from Haryana looked at him and said, if you don't give medicine, what kind of a doctor are you? And he realized that they connected a doctor with treatment and healing. Writing a prescription was not healing. So I think that became clear to even an uneducated person, the guy sitting in front of him, is not making him feel better by giving him a piece of paper. So I think what you're saying is absolutely right, Sunil. And I think the emphasis should be on bringing down the cost of the interaction rather than bypassing the interaction. One more point is just my observation and my belief that, you know, the doctors, at least the junior doctors <clears throat> in Indian hospitals are so stretched in government institutes, they're so stretched in an OPD that if they if a system comes in to relieve them of one hour of their time, I'm not sure. In fact, I'm convinced that they are not going to give practice empathy in that one hour. They are going to look at the smartphone because there are several messages to catch up with. 
So any time that is saved because of technology, we are just foolishly believing that that will be diverted to empathy. It will not. Empathy can be given by the busiest person. Yes. You know, there is a saying that you want to get something done, ask a busy person to do it. So, you know, it's a total facade that we need time given by technology to give empathy. Where is the connection? Empathy is part and parcel of the head, hand and heart, you know, triangle. If we have more time, we will watch a movie or we will, you know, chat with our friends. That's the way technology is going. See, that is the way when you explain, it starts in the training. I still remember ward rounds with my, with my professors, Fen and other people. You saw how they treated patients. And that's how you learned. Now it's all from Google and reading books. And people, you want to see, whereas we saw our teachers treat, dealing with patients in front of us. And that is how we learned how to deal with the patient. And I think that was much more important than the subject knowledge that books gave you. And I, it's more and more. I mean, I, I was looking at uh, the statistics in the UK. Government has cut down medical school places. And by cutting down, we are training fewer doctors. If you train fewer doctors, your workload remains exactly the same. The doctor has no time to treat the number of patients. And I think there has to be a degree of enlightened thinking, what you're saying. It has to start with imparting the values. I mean, being, being cornered by George Chandy or Colin John in the corridor and being asked the difficult questions about anatomy field, and then getting the answers taught me that in order to learn something, you need somebody who's interested in you being a better doctor, not something from Google. So I think interaction is very important. It doesn't have to be in engineering. It doesn't have to be in any other field. But I believe, and this is one thing which I'm trying to put together, Processes in medicine are completely different from processes in any other domain. It's very difficult to tell my engineer friends that they, my brother is an engineer and he doesn't understand why we don't have the same precision in medicine. And I was telling him that the processes in medicine are different from the processes in any other domain. The chief executive uh, officer of my last hospital was an archaeologist. He is not only used to dealing with dead things, he's used to dealing with things that died hundreds of years ago. <laughs> and I tried to point out to him, I said, Stephen, but that is the system at the moment. You can be put into, uh, be the CEO executive of the hospital with no clinical exposure at all. And I think that's the, the tendency we should change. Yeah. And one, one of the points that Sunil made, I, I, it re, it's really important to emphasize that. Physicians need to be in the forefront of innovation, technological innovation and in any kind of innovation, physicians need to be in the forefront because they they understand the science and they are the ones that are actually holding the hand of the patient. They are facing it, facing you know on the on the the most important physician patient relationship. They are the ones. They have the knowledge and they are the ones that are responsible for the care. And so they should be, you know, heading any kind of innovative efforts, whether it is technology, whether it is drugs, whether it is devices, whether it is new procedures, I, you know, and, 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 and that's basically the main mission of Innovator MD. Yeah. The reason why I started that is because physicians were being sidelined in this technological revolution in, in whatever, you know, new things that are coming down. When a physician is involved, then you know that, okay, you know, this is something that is based on a solid scientific basis uh, because this person is a trained physician who understands not only the medical side, but also the technical side, right? So we need physicians who can bridge that gap between technology and, and the caring part of medicine. Unless we have physicians in those roles, we are going to see more and more things coming down the pike that'll be forced on physicians that have no clinical bearing, that have no advantage, whether it is cost or time or or, 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 or the effective science, um, unless a physician is there at the leadership table in that company. And, and that's, that's the emphasis that we place 
at Innovator MD is that physicians have to be the leaders in the science, not Uli, somebody else. Let me add to the other side of it. For the last 20 years, I've advised the CEO. At that time, he was the CEO of Tata Consultancy Services. Now he's moved up the ladder. He's now the number two in authority to Ratan Tata, to the Chandra, who the current uh, chairman of Tata Sons. And when he first started off, his criteria was he wanted a physician who could explain things to him. And throughout every project that TCS has been involved in, medical and non-medical, that has been useful. One of the things we have to admit, the clinicians are not always good at articulating either their knowledge or their needs to the yeah. IT person. So you tell the IT person what you want. I don't know why, but there is, we are very good at explaining clinical things, but we cannot explain our other. So when IT company and an IT expert comes to a doctor, the doctor cannot explain what he wants clear enough. So the IT person makes a, I mean, decides to solve the problem that he sees exists. And by the time the project is complete, the IT guy is trying to solve a problem which no longer bothers the doctor. So it has to be two ways. The doctors should be educated to communicate their own expert knowledge to a non-medical person in his language. Yes. Rather, so the, the difficulties lie on both. I've, with, with, yeah, yeah. The, with Mr. Andhra, so, I've been on the interface of clinical. And one of the things that he, whenever he introduced me to somebody, usually a very important person whose value I didn't know, but he knew. He would say, you know, Dr. Singh explains medicine to us and explains technology to doctors. And that's why we find him useful. So what you're saying is absolutely right. But part of the fault also lies with clinicians exactly. who are unable to articulate their need and have the so, patience to articulate their need to somebody who has no idea of medicine. So here, here is how we solve that. Here is how we solve that problem. Physicians need to learn. And there's there's no other way. A physician needs to learn how technology works. Physicians need to learn how the business of medicine works. Physicians need to learn how to translate, you know, what we see in the exam room in the clinical setting. How do we translate that into a technological solution? How do we translate that into a business solution? And th th there's no other way. You know, if we don't create that space. And, and that's why we we do, you know, by the way, for your listeners, every Thursday, we have a class, a master class. That's exactly the reason why we do it, you know, about 40 master classes a year. And it's free. By the way, anybody can join that. The reason why we do that is because physicians need to understand the other side. And, and, and then they are able, they are able to articulate what exactly they want to see in that new tool, new drug, new device, or whatever. But, you know, we cannot stay, just stay within medicine and say, I don't know anything about that and I don't care. You have to care. Otherwise, somebody else will force it on you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. I think one of the things that the medical medical fraternity and the medical teaching communities must uh, is to reinforce uh, clinical training in medical students. I feel that till they reach PG level, there is no need to introduce them to the complexities of artificial intelligence because the basis of being a doctor is to first learn the, you know, the empathy factor, compassionate communication, teamwork, which is slowly being displaced because they are under this impression that, you know, you don't even need to see a patient. Technology is going to solve a misconception, but that is the way we are uh, doling out, saying that, you know, technology is going to have a solution for everything. It will not. I mean, I hear stories of my kids. I don't work in more. They just come and say, doctor, please explain what does all this mean? And the thick file D dimers and uh, you know thyroid function tests and nobody's even talk to them, and the doctors themselves don't know what they are interpreting. It's a whole lot of data, which yes. makes no sense at all. See, so, when I went to do my you're absolutely right. When I went to do my fellowship at Johns Hopkins, every Wednesday we used to have a meeting of the clinicians, four clinicians who were working in the lab, and four lab scientists. 
I don't know how many of my clinical friends know what exactly takes place in ELISA test. I had read, read about it, immune linked uh, assay and everything, but I had to grow antibodies in the rabbit. I had to grow antibodies in various things and then actually coat the plates, put the, the, the antigen in, get the measurement. And I found that taught me more, but I don't know any other clinician who has done that. So I find what you're saying is absolutely right. The exposure, the, the clinician should be uh, made to understand that all this extra knowledge doesn't make you a doctor, but makes you a better doctor. And as you know, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore is setting up a medical school. Indian, uh, the IIT Kanpur is setting up a medical school. Why? Because Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, found that they were devising these new antivirus tests, but they had nowhere to test it on. Then they had to go to explain to clinicians in institutions saying, this is the COVID test we have devised. Can you work on it and check it out for us? So the Govind Rajan, who's the director of IIC, was here for the same reason. They are setting up a postgraduate medical school. They said, we don't want to train doctors. We want doctors who are already to introduce them to technology and get their help in taking it forward. I think that is exactly the model that uh, you, you are saying about it. It shouldn't cut into the medical education. I think we have spoken enough. Uh, George is waiting to <laughs> I, I see Nainan Chako and uh, Vishy Mahadevan, Vivek, Patish. Anyone has anything to say to add? If not, uh, I think I'll request Jacob to thank our eminent panelists and, and uh, take us forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really, really enlightening. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So there's one question from our uh, uh, head of the Department of Ophthalmology, Satish Thomas, sir. Does it boil down to the importance of ethical reflections in medical practice? Advances in technology and AI raises the stakes. So, Sunil, sir, would you respond to that? Yes, the answer is yes. That are emerging from uh, these new developments, certainly. And uh, if it's not done now, it will be because at least in India, where the medical fraternity has just given up and become servile to uh, the new stakeholders in healthcare, real estate agents, engineers, biomedical engineers, health tech, everybody is a digital and a health tech expert. So there is a need to question and to deliberate on these aspects that will have a profound effect on the personhood of the human being. The brain, the heart, the pocket, that's it. And in, I would appeal to the ethicists, I know Satish is one, that there must be a huge national, international discussion on the ethics of uh, technology which is coming into medicine in a big way. I mean, as I said, just the fact that there is, no, there is no testing required for any of these, it is just released. And how, how do you make healthcare into a stock market like hospital selling itself? Is there no rule for that? 5X, 10X, 15X? There is not, the word patient appear in several articles. Times and in money matters. Healthcare articles do not come in healthcare magazines. And they are eloquent about how this is all business. So, yes, the answer is yes, there's a multi dimensional ethical you know, frontier that's developing. And the sooner it can be addressed, the better it is. Yeah. Jacob. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, before we close, one last question. One person at the forefront of innovation in technology and always leading the front in technology advancements is Elon Musk. 
the richest man in the globe in the in all over the world so he says that artificial intelligence is more dangerous than nuclear bombs so what is your response to this uh, dr oli we'll close with this one last question sure that's a good question artificial intelligence is a tool nuclear bomb is a tool right you can use it for good or you can use it for bad and whether you use it for good or whether you use it for bad that comes from human beings right the way we are going to program artificial intelligence are we going to program it to do good or you can program it to do bad you know as we have seen you know some of the use use cases uh same thing you know uh you know nuclear reactions you can use it to generate power electricity or you can use it to destroy cities and countries so it's up to us the future is in our hands and how we want to mold it and we how we want to shape it um again uh, you know uh, ethics is important scientific inquiry is important and measuring outcomes is important so as long as you're doing that you'll be okay but there's no guarantee like any other technology it can be used for bad things um this is no different thank you sir thank, thank you, you so much that was a very pragmatic response to this question and uh, before we end let me thank our speakers uh, sunil chandi sir oli sir and arvind singh sir for bringing us this beautiful perspective of a birds i view not only a birds i view but also in depth discourse of what ai is and what the future of ai is going to be in healthcare so we are extremely grateful for this and um, and one thing which i found in common was that all three of you were on the same page when it comes to compassionate care and when it comes to uh, the role of a doctor so there is a lot of ray a lot of uh, hope for us uh, doctors uh, because we feel that even ai in healthcare is for now in safe hands so on that note uh, i would like to thank all three of you thank you for joining us and also our uh director and ceo george chandy sir for ably moderating the session and before we close let me um tell you about the next session it's on uh, the 22nd of this month we have a pediatric endocrinologist from the united states of america talking on short stature and this is at 6:30 pm indian standard time on uh, on the 22nd of this month so uh advance christmas wishes to all of you and you. thank you to all our uh, listeners who have tuned in looking forward uh, with another very impactful session thank you so much uh, signing off from believers church medical thank college you, thank, thank you thank you for thank you for organizing this and good to meet you dr uli and dr arvin we'll keep in touch thank, thank you. you yes thank you thank you merry christmas merry christmas